Thanks there to Alison and Chris. Hello and welcome to all of our international viewers. I'm Robin Kerno in Atlanta. And I'm Hannah Bourne Jones, live for you in Manchester, England. You can hear the bells tolling there. Investigators are now closing in on those responsible for the worst terror attack in this city's history. Three more people have just been arrested in raids linked to Monday's deadly concert bombing in Manchester. So far, only the attacker has been named. 22-year-old Salman Abedi, a British citizen and a Manchester native, killed himself along with at least 22 others. Many of his victims, just children, just teenagers. Vadi was already known to intelligence services. That's already been confirmed. And the Home Secretary here, Amber Rudd, says it is unlikely that Abedi acted alone. It was a devastating occasion. It was, as you say, more sophisticated than some of the attacks we've seen before. And it seems likely possible that he wasn't doing this on his own. So the intelligence services and the police are pursuing their leads in order to make sure that they get all the information and reduce, therefore, the risk that they need to keep us all safe. Well, with those behind this deadly attack still potentially on the loose, Britain's terror threat has now been raised to its highest possible level. That's critical. CNN's Nina Dos Santos has more now on what this means. Nina, three people we understand who now have been arrested just in the last couple of minutes. Where do we stand now on the investigation? Does this then suggest that this individual was not actually acting alone at all, a much wider group at work? Well, the picture that we seem to be getting from authorities is one of somebody who pro perhaps may not have been acting alone, but they haven't actually identified who or whether or not he was acting with anyone else in particular. And that is the main reason why we have this upgrade in security to the highest threat level that this country has faced. Um, only the third time that we've seen the threat level in this country raised to critical, which means that another attack may well be imminent. Earlier today, we saw the Prime Minister, the Home Secretary, and also the Foreign Secretary, other key members of the government and security officials meet for their third emergency meeting since the Manchester attack took place. Um, and we're also seeing, I should say, a marked uptick in the security presence, particularly in this part of London. I'm broadcasting to you right from number 10 Downing Street, which is between Trafalgar Square at one end of Whitehall and the Palace of Westminster, where Parliament is, just up the road. Whitehall, the road between the two, has been completely closed. What we're seeing is police officers checking all of the drains, the lamp posts, everything, the typical kind of in-depth security checks that you see around major landmarks. We know that uh, we're going to have an increased uh, presence around particularly army officers around key tourist landmarks, including Buckingham Palace, foreign embassies, number 10 Downing Street here, and also uh, the Palace of Westminster too. You can hear helicopters above. There has been an uptick in security. We haven't yet seen the troops that are going to be working alongside police officers to guard uh, major events and places like this arrive here at number 10 Downing Street, but we understand they may well arrive throughout the course of the day, probably this afternoon, Hannah. Nina, you mentioned there that the army has been deployed in certain areas across the country, that the threat level has been raised now to critical. For citizens across this country watching this programme, what should they expect over the course of the next coming, of the, of the coming days, and for how long should they expect perhaps an army presence on their streets? Yeah, an army presence of up to 3,800 troops who are going to be guarding key landmarks and also um, sporting events, concerts, so on and so forth. That'll be an issue for the upcoming FA Cup that's taking place here in Wembley Stadium in London this very weekend. Um, so expect heightened security, expect some roads to be closed, like, for instance, Whitehall, further towards my left, which is completely shut down at the moment. So that's going to cause some transport issues. Um, for the British people, it's taken them a while to get used to the idea of having armed police officers on our streets. We now have more armed police officers, but think about the difference between having the army on the streets. That is quite an unprecedented situation. It gives you an idea of the kind of level of security um, that this country is facing at the moment. And the reason why this threat is up at critical, I should point out, Hannah, it's only been at critical, as I said before, three times uh, since these 
uh, threat levels have been made public in 2006. The reason why it's at that level is because they cannot, at the moment, ascertain whether any of those individuals that they've arrested over the course of the last 24, 48 hours were actually working with this individual. If he was a lone wolf attacker, well, the threat may be less severe, but they cannot ascertain whether he was working alone or with somebody else, and they seem to be leaning towards uh, the hypothesis that he may have had help here. He may have traveled to other countries where he could have uh, learned bomb-making expertise. He may have had some kind of manpower help here in the UK until they can determine where the links are the threat level is likely probably to stay at critical. In the past, it's only stayed at critical for a couple of days because remember that it does present some issues for a country like this that is trying to get on with an election cycle. We've got elections coming up at the start of next month. Campaigning has been suspended for a second day, uh, but the objective for authorities is to keep the country moving, but to keep the people safe. Nina Dos Santos, we appreciate it, Nina. Live for us outside 10 Downing Street. Nina, of course, saying there, uh, confirming what we already know, that the campaigning for the election has at least been put on hold for the next couple of days. Well, we are now learning more about uh, some of the victims who were killed in this Manchester bombing. The youngest victim, eight-year-old Safi Rose Roussos, a primary school student in, from Lancashire. She's been described as simply a beautiful little girl with a creative flair. Her school says she was loved by everyone, and her warmth and kindness will be remembered fondly. 18-year-old Georgina Callender was also killed in this attack. She met her idol, Ariana Grande, at a concert back in 2015, posting this photo on her Instagram account. Georgina was a student at Runshaw College in Lancashire. And John Atkinson was in his late 20s. He was a former student at Berry College, described as a happy, as a gentle person. Well, 15-year-old Olivia Campbell was missing following the concert uh, on Monday night, and we have now learnt that Olivia died in the attack. Her mother broke the very sad news on Facebook. Let's bring in Erin McLaughlin now. Erin is at the Manchester Royal Infirmary uh, with more on this, more on the details of Olivia's death and also the many people who have been treated in that hospital behind you, Erin. That's right, Hannah. Uh, Olivia's story is absolutely heartbreaking. One of 22 such stories, 22 people killed in this tragic terror attack. She, Olivia Campbell is described as funny, bubbly, with a cheeky sense of humor. She was much loved by her family. Like many others at the concert, 15-year-old Olivia Campbell was excited to be there. It was half past eight. She'd seen the supporting acts. She said they were amazing. She was waiting for Ariana to come on and she was so happy. Um, and she thanked me and said she loved me. And that was the last I heard from her. When Olivia's mother, Charlotte, last spoke to CNN, she'd hoped her daughter was alive, simply missing. Now the news the family feared, Olivia is among the dead killed by a terrorist bomb at the Manchester Arena. Her mother confirmed the news on Facebook, writing, R.I.P. my darling, precious, gorgeous girl, Olivia, taken far, far too soon. Mummy loves you so much. Olivia's just a bubbly child, cheeky, as cheeky as anything. Um, if you're feeling down, she'll make you laugh. If she can't make you laugh, she'll hug you until you're smiling again. It's not until it happens to you, you, you deep down and go, That's now I know how them people felt. It's impossible to imagine that family's pain. Uh, earlier today, we also received an update from the chief of hospitals for this area on the injured. The number of injured being treated by some eight hospitals has climbed from 59 to 64. Of those 64, 20 critically wounded. Uh, the chief of the hospitals also talked about the preparations currently underway for the possibility of more terror attacks in light of the threat level being raised countrywide. Hannah. Uh, and Erin, just briefly, we now know that 64 people are being treated for their injuries after this attack on Monday night. Do we have any idea of the, the types of injuries that these people are being treated for and whether they are critical or not? 
That's right. Uh, the chief of hospitals for this region said 64 currently being treated. Uh, of those 64, 20 have been critically wounded. Uh, the, the hospital chief, though, is not going into specifics on the nature of those injuries out of respect for the families uh, and their loved ones. Um, but you know, it, what is clear, he said, that it's not just about the physical injuries, the physical injuries being sustained by the victims of this attack. He also said that they're making preparations to help uh, met the mental health of the victims as well, and not just the people suffering from physical wounds, but also the people in the surrounding areas. He said that they're currently preparing a, a mental health package uh, to deal with that as well for everyone, really, in the Manchester area dealing with this attack. And thank you very much. Erin's outside the Manchester Royal Infirmary. Well, for some, of course, this attack brings back very painful memories indeed. Joining me now is Mike Haynes. Mike's brother, David, was an aid worker held captive and killed by ISIS back in 2014. Mike, thanks very much for joining us. Um, ISIS has claimed responsibility for, for this attack, although there is no evidence as yet to, to, to prove that that is true. We do, however, know that this group is capable of heinous crimes, such as the one that committed uh, on your brother. When you when you heard about this attack. Can you put into words your reaction? There is, whenever a terror attack, no matter where in the world it is, it hits in the stomach. Um, we know that families are suffering, that my family has suffered, like many, many others. You know, the, it, it's a terrible feeling. And certainly the, the shock, the disgust, the repulsion, at the deliberate targeting of women and children uh, 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 beyond heinous. Are you concerned about the tentacles of ISIS or of terror groups seeming to spread that much further? What happened to your brother happened on foreign soil, this attack yes. now happening here uh, in Britain. Are you concerned particularly about the nature of this attack? Everybody has to be concerned. They have shown through this cowardly act that they will strike at any target. So we have to be concerned. But we cannot change our ways. Yes, we have to increase security, and the government are doing that. Yes, we have to be more aware ourselves and take a certain amount of responsibility ourselves. But we can't change our ways. As soon as we stop going to concerts, as soon as we stop going to countries on holiday, as soon as we change our ways, they've won. It's, it's not easy to say that, but I understand why you're saying that. There are, of course, though, so many young people, so many children terrified now. I mean, we were hearing from youngsters yesterday as well saying that they were scared that, uh, that someone was going to come to their school or come to their home uh, and try to kill them. What advice, if you can give any, would you give to parents who are grieving for their loved ones or to children and parents as well who are trying to, to try to get their kids through this? To, to any of the families of the victims, to anybody affected by what's happened, uh, I would really strongly advise them to reach out and get help. There are many groups uh, around the country that can help. Here in Manchester area, we have the Foundation for Peace. Uh, their Survivors Assistance Network has helped me personally a great deal, and they do fantastic work. Um, but there are many groups, but I would strongly recommend the Foundation for Peace. Yeah, very good advice. And um, the threat level in the country has now been raised to critical. It's the highest uh, level that it can be at. It does mean that a, an attack is potentially imminent. Um, does it make you feel safer knowing that we are on such a high alert for potential future attacks? It is scary. But it also shows that the government are taking steps. Having armed troops, I served in the forces myself. Right. Having my fellow servicemen on the streets is worrying. But they're there for the safety of 
our nation. They're to protect. They're not there for martial law or anything like that. It's to free up the police to do the police job. You wonder how long, though, it will be, uh, I say tolerated, but acceptable, I suppose, though, to see soldiers, to see armed forces on the, on the streets of Britain. People might want it right now, but in a week or two, people might say, well, no, actually, I want to go to that football game and I don't want to have to go through extra security in order to get into the stadium, etc. Um, do you think that it might be scaled back and that this is just the immediate backlash, the immediate result of, I, of this I don't, attack? I don't think it's a knee-jerk reaction. Right. It is a very well thought out plan. It will be scaled back at the earliest opportunity. It is not something that the security services, the police, the government want to happen. So they will reduce it as soon as they can. Uh, and we will go back to our normal police on the streets. It's so good of you to sp spare the time to talk to us today. I'm so sorry for your loss, of course, and the loss of David thank a couple you. of years back. Mike Keynes, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Well, we will have uh, plenty more live from Manchester on this terror investigation uh, coming up this hour. But next, our Robin Kerner will bring you some of the other top stories of the day, including President Trump's first face-to-face -face meeting with Pope Francis. And I'll be back in just a moment from Manchester with the latest on this uh, UK concert terror attack. First, a look at some of the ways cities around the world are showing solidarity with the people here in Manchester. In Paris, the Eiffel Tower went dark Tuesday night for the 22 victims killed in the attack at the Ariana Grande concert. In Dubai, they projected an image of the British flag atop the world's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa. And in Hong Kong, the HSBC building illuminated with a simple message, we stand with the United Kingdom. We'll be right back after this break. Its hearts a flutter. Hi, I'm Gong Yoo. At 37, he is South Korea's man of the moment. This month, we're with the actor in Seoul as he opens up about his reluctant stardom. What don't you like about fame? And reveals perhaps what fans want to know most. Are you a good kisser? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Watch me on Talk Asia, only on CNN. Talk Asia, Thursday on CNN. CNN World Rugby. It's the Sevens World Series for both men and women. We've got the numbers and the names. Follow the rugby action on and off the pitch with CNN's Alex Thomas and Christina McFarlane. We'll bring you match highlights and training tips. Kick off your weekend with CNN World Rugby. Saturday on CNN. In association with DHL. Sunday on CNN. Get a jump on the U.S. political scene with Inside Politics. The Republican president threatened to oppose members of his own party. Then, State of the Union with Jake Tapper. Should President Trump apologize to President Obama and to the American people? Fareed Zakaria, GPS. We are living through a sea change in politics. And connect the world with Becky Anderson. With respect, sir, let me just stop you there government. for one moment. That is not the government. Sunday on CNN. What time is the flight? No one asks us to go. Not friends. Not family. Hello. No one asks us to go. Into the storm. Into the chaos. Into the heartbreak. drives us forward. Welcome. It's the story that needs to be heard. It's the story that needs to be told. This is 
why we go. Hi everyone, I'm Robin Kerno in Atlanta. We'll go back to Manchester and Hannah Vaughan Jones in just a moment. But first I want to update you on US President Trump's trip to the Vatican. We do know that Pope Francis and US President Trump may be far apart on many issues, but their first face-to-face -face meeting seemed to be cordial. The two held private talks at the Vatican just hours ago. Despite their public criticism of each other during the US presidential race last year, the mood appeared upbeat. Well, our Ben Wiedemann has been following President Trump's trip, and he joins me now from Rome. Uh, do we know what these two men said to each other? Well, actually, we did receive a statement from the Vatican that said that, uh, that it was a cordial talk and that, uh, for instance, uh, they did uh, discuss the importance of political negotiations and interfaith dialogue with particular reference to the situation in the Middle East and regarding the situation of Christian minorities uh, in that area. They also apparently stressed the importance of serene relations uh, between the Catholic Church in the United States and the U.S. U.S. government in areas of health care, education, and assistant, assistance to immigrants. Obviously, as we saw during the rather rambunctious U.S. electoral campaign, the Pope and uh, Mr. Trump did exchange barbs along the way, but it does appear that this was largely a cordial meeting. Now, we did see, for instance, the pool reporters who were there did say that at certain times it was a rather stiff encounter uh, but by the end it appears when they came out for their final appearance together uh, that they did seem to have broken the ice between the two and according to one person I spoke with it appears that at least the Pope was charmed by Melania Trump the first lady and uh, despite the expectations of possibility of friction it does appear at this point that it was indeed a cordial meeting. Robin. Uh, seeming to go off without a hitch, and we're seeing CNN's headline on CNN.com says that Trump tells Pope Francis, I won't forget what you said. Some moments of that meeting, of course, uh, were private. Uh, the, the press release you got had a lot of sort of uh, very pol politically correct uh, descriptions of what perhaps was said. But for the Pope, what does he want from Donald Trump? What do you think he tried to get across? Well, I think he tried to stress those themes that are important to him. He is a great believer in the dangers posed by climate change. He is a great proponent of refugee rights, keeping in mind, of course, that he has, for instance, gone to Greece, uh, gone to refugee camps and brought back uh, to Rome Syrian refugees which who are currently uh, being taken care of and being integrated into Italian society by the Catholic Church, by the Vatican. So he is clearly very interested in those areas, trying perhaps uh, to persuade President Trump of the validity of his arguments. There are other areas where they do more or less see eye to eye, opposition to abortion and euthanasia. Uh, so it's not as if despite the very high profile differences of opinion we saw in the past, uh, they do have some areas of agreement. Robin? And they gave each other some gifts. What, what, share with us what, uh, what they handed over. Yes, President Trump gave uh, Pope Francis a set of books by Martin Luther King. And in exchange, the Pope handed over to the president. In addition to a plaque, he also gave, them, gave him uh, several of his works, uh, which deal with climate change and some of the shortfalls of capitalism uh, as well. So interesting reading to go to Mr. Tr president Trump. We know he's not a big reader of books, but perhaps given that he received those books from Pope Francis, perhaps he'll crack them along the way. Robin? Perhaps. Thanks so much. Ben Wiedemann there in Rome.
Okay, back to Washington, D.C. now, where Mr. Trump's White House is reacting to explosive testimony from the former head of the CIA. Now, John Brennan says Intel revealed what he called Russia's brazen interference in the U.S. Presiden presidential election. And, and that's not all, as CNN jo jo CNN's Joe Johns now reports. Take a look. I encountered and am aware of information and intelligence that um, revealed contacts and interactions between Russian officials and U.S. persons involved in the uh, Trump campaign. The former head of the CIA, John Brennan, testifying for the first time, he saw concerning evidence of Russian operatives attempting to recruit Trump aides during the campaign. It uh, raised questions in my mind, again, whether or not the Russians were able to gain the cooperation of those individuals. Brennan conceding he did not see any proof of collusion before leaving office. And these are contacts that might have been totally, totally innocent and benign. While stressing there was enough evidence for an investigation. I know what the Russians try to do. They try to suborn individuals and they try to get individuals, including U.S. persons, to act on their behalf either wittingly or unwittingly. Frequently, individuals who go along that treasonous path do not even realize they're along that path until it gets to be a bit too late. The White House seizing on Brennan's comments, saying in a statement, despite a year of investigation, there is still no evidence of Russia-Trump campaign collusion. Meanwhile, the Senate Intelligence Committee issuing two new subpoenas to businesses owned by President Trump's former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, after Flynn pled the fifth, refusing to comply with a previous request to turn over all documents related to the Russia investigation. While we disagree with General Flynn's lawyer's interpretation of taking the fifth, uh, clear it is even more clear that a business does not have a right to take a fifth. Committee leadership holding open the possibility of holding Flynn in contempt of Congress if he continues to ignore their requests. If, in fact, uh, there's not a response, we'll seek additional counsel advice on how to proceed forward. Uh, at the end of that option is a contempt charge, and I've said that everything is on the table. The White House now gearing up for a prolonged fight after initially dismissing the Russia probe as a witch hunt. The president hiring his longtime attorney, Mark Kasowitz, to represent him on matters relating to the investigation. That was Joe John's reporting there. Well, the White House is defending also its budget proposal despite sharp criticism. Budget Director Mick Mulvaney says the budget is based on projections the U.S. economy will grow by 3% a year. Economists say that's unrealistic at best. The proposal would make deep cuts to social and environmental programs and also to foreign aid. We look at spending differently. We're no longer going to measure compassion by the number of programs or the number of people on those programs, but by the number of people we help get off of those programs. We're not going to measure compassion by the amount of money that we spend, but by the number of people that we help. Uh, and that is how you can get 3% economic growth. That is how you can balance the budget in 10 years. That is how you can borrow money from people with still promising and intending to pay it back from them. Well, Democrats and even some Republicans in Congress call the proposal dead on arrival. Democratic Senator Ron Wyden tweeted this picture of the budget plan in the recycling bin. Well, the security situation in the UK is tense after Monday's terror attack. Police are carrying out raids across the city as part of the terror investigation. Of course, we'll have more updates from Hannah Vaughan Jones in Manchester just after the short break. Stay with us. You're watching CNN. What is this place? The Modern Software Factory, a hub of digital transformation. Is this where we come to compete? This is what you build to compete, where insight drives experience, where automation delivers better apps faster, where agile isn't just a buzzword, it's a way of life. What about security? Strong, yet frictionless. All working together at scale. It's about moving to new from old. Oh, that's not right. I'll put mine back on. I learned a long time ago when I was first confronted with outrageous behavior in places like the Balkans, when one side was slaughtering another because of its ethnic and religious definition. I learned that as a journalist, I could not be morally equivalent, and nor could I present false factual equivalents. I insist on being truthful, not neutral. CNN.
and money. Your new destination for business news. On TV, online, on the go. Because leaving home doesn't mean living less. Stay at a hotel that has the news source you trust. Stay at a CNN Partner Hotel. I'm Aisha Sase in Los Angeles. I'm John Balls in San Bernardino, California. You're watching CNN's breaking coverage of that mass shooting. A couple hundred people here now marching onto City Hall here in San Francisco. You didn't name Bill Cosby then. Many people again will ask the question, why now? Donald Trump came all the way down here, and the issue of who would pay for the wall just never came up. A deal can be done and can result in the release of some girls. I'm Leila Santiago in Mexico City, and this is CNN. Welcome back to our viewers around the world. I'm Hannah Vaughan Jones, live for you here in Manchester, where the sun is out, as you can see. We're on Albert Square, uh, and the gorgeous town hall, Manchester Town Hall, is just behind us. The sun might be out, but it doesn't mean uh, that the city has yet come to terms with the atrocity that it endured on Monday night. Britain, as a country, is now facing a critical terror threat as police make three more arrests linked to Monday's bombing here in Manchester. Westminster warns that another attack could indeed be imminent. Throughout the morning, we've been getting stunning new information about this very fast-moving investigation to find those behind the bombing. The attacker himself, a 22-year-old British citizen, was indeed known to intelligence services, and he may not have acted alone. CNN's Clarissa Ward has the latest details for you. New details emerging about suspected Manchester bomber Salman Abedi. British officials telling reporters it seems likely that Abedi did not act alone and that he was known to intelligence services. I'm sure we will find out more what level they knew about him in due course. The 22-year-old, born in Britain to Libyan parents, had recently returned to the UK from Libya, according to British officials. He was a business student at the University of Salford, but had stopped attending classes. A family friend described him as a lonely child, noticing that he recently appeared to become more devout, growing a beard and dressing in long robes. This information coming as England remains on high alert, raising its threat level to critical for the first time in a decade. Their assessment is not only that an attack remains highly likely, but that a further attack may be imminent. Experts noting that the sophistication of the bomb and its target could indicate influence from a larger terror cell. Oh my God! ISIS taking responsibility, but so far British authorities have no evidence supporting that claim. You cannot defeat us because love in the end is always stronger than hate. Yeah. A moment of silence in Manchester, a city grief-stricken but resilient, pausing to remember those lost, including eight-year-old Safi Rose Roussos. Her teacher says she was simply a beautiful girl, loved by everyone. Georgina Callender was 18, a superfan who met Ariana Grande in 2015, tweeting how excited she was to see the pop singer the night before. 26-year-old John Atkinson was a college student who loved to dance, his local dance studio calling him an amazingly happy, gentle person and a real pleasure to teach. And 15-year-old Olivia Campbell also lost in the attack. She was waiting for Ariana to come on and she was so happy. Um, and she thanked me and said she loved me. And that was the last... <laughs> I heard from her. her mother making an emotional plea to CNN for help finding her daughter before confirming hours later that she was killed, posting this touching memorial online. 
as you can see there from Clarissa Ward's report, this attack was especially heartless because it seemed to target children, to target teenagers and their parents. Randy Kay has been listening to what those who survived the attack have to say about it. Teenagers and young children desperate to get out alive. Ariana Grande's young fans, mostly girls, suddenly targets of a suicide bomber. Like there was children in there as young as five. There was a little girl literally sat in front of me who was that small. She had to stand on her seat just to watch the concert. For so many young fans, this was likely their first concert without their parents. So imagine the chaos as the bomber detonated his explosives just as kids made their way towards the exit. As concert goers spilled onto the streets, this homeless man stepped in to help the children. It was children, you know what I mean? And it was a lot of children with blood all over them and everything, so and crying and screaming. Terror is not something the pop star's young admirers were prepared for, and neither were their parents. First, there was fear after learning of the bombing, then guilt for letting their children go to the show the scariest night of their lives. There was a split was moment where we said to each other, we thought, well, like, we're going to die because yeah. you're just running for your life. There were children crying, trying to um, get in contact with the parents. There were parents on their phones who obviously were upset. They were crying, trying to get in contact with the kids. Uh, it, was, it was just an awful, awful thing to witness. An awful thing to witness, in some cases for mothers and daughters alike out for what had promised to be a memorable night together. For sure now, they'll never forget it. She's just been crying. She's just saying, why did these things happen to people? Why did they keep doing this to people? Some too young, too innocent to likely even understand this new reality their parents know all too well. I feel sad that um, um, concerts have to be ruined by people that are so mean and um, the Ariana Grande can't do a concert. Randy K, CNN, New York. The area where the attacker set off the bomb at that Ariana Grande concert is also significant in this investigation. It happened near the exits, catching the crowd as all the people left that concert arena. Well, our Diana Magni has more now on how these areas are so difficult for security. Panic ripples through the arena. What's going on? What just happened? After people realize what just happened and run. The blast in a public area in the foyer of the arena where parents were gathering to take their children home. Whoever was waiting there may not have had to go through security, but Wait, would have been well placed to cause maximum damage just as crowds were leaving. Come on. At the Paris attacks in November 2015, three suicide bombers detonated their devices outside the Stade de France football stadium after a routine security check detected explosives on one of them. In the terror attacks at Brussels Airport in March 2016, the bombers were inside the departures hall, easily accessible, without having to go through any kind of security check. The Russians have learned that lesson. After terror attacks at Russian airports, there are metal detectors and security gates at the entrances to airports and major railway stations. But they don't necessarily stop people intent on killing. Here in Volgograd in 2013, the suicide bomber detonating their device at the security barrier at the station entrance. Wherever the security, there will always be bottlenecks and vulnerabilities. You just can't remove the fact that people are going to have to queue up uh, to get from unsecured areas to secured areas. You've got to put those security barriers, those security checks somewhere. Um, but, 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 but what uh, security officials are trying to emphasize now uh, is to um, put those security barriers in places and in such a manner where you're minimizing uh, those bottlenecks and you're, you're protecting uh, areas of a facility, an airport, uh, a, a concert venue where uh, you have um, the largest concentration of, of people. Already in Manchester, some concert goers questioned whether security at Monday night's concert was adequate. 
Security wasn't really up to standards as compared to normal concerts. Basically, we went in, we weren't searched at all. It was just to scan the tickets and that was it. Other friends I've talked to, they had bags and they weren't checked. It just was quite lackadaisical. Expect enhanced security checks at concert venues in the months to come. But as the recent history of attacks in Europe testify, terrorists intent on carnage tend to find a way. Diana Magne, CNN, London. OK, let's get a closer look now at the investigation into this attack on Monday night and, of course, the raids that are currently going on across the country. Dal Babu is the former chief superintendent for the Metropolitan uh, Police in London and joins me now from the capital city. Dal, good to talk to you again. Let's talk, first of all, about the, the news this morning that three arrests have been made so far. What does that tell you about whether this individual, the suspect in this case, was a, a lone wolf or indeed part of a wider terror cell? I, th I think all the evidence suggests that this is part of a wider cell. I think to develop a vest with uh, bomb making uh, issues on it, wearing it, going in, in and detonating it, you need a level of sophistication. Very, very different to what we had um, in, in Westminster uh, a few months ago, where somebody had taken a bunch of kitchen knives and, and a hire car and mowed down individuals. I think this is a higher level of depravity. All, all terrorist attacks are uh, horrendous, but this is a level of depravity. It's callous, brutal, targeted, young, vulnerable, mainly girls who are on their own. And I think people will be absolutely horrified at, at the depravity of this individual. It's, it's just absolutely shocking what's happened. Perhaps even more shocking, though, Dal, the fact that this individual was known to the authorities. Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary, confirmed that uh, today. Do you have any indication as to how much they might have known about him, whether he was on the radar or whether he was just maybe guilty of some petty crimes in the past and wasn't really of a major concern to the authorities? It's, it's very, very unclear at the moment, and I think in some ways uh, we, we need to give the authorities time to actually look at all the issues. Uh, I, mean, I think one of the authorities were quite frustrated that the name came out fairly early because I think they were looking at the element of surprise to go and identify his network of friends. And, and in that time, as soon as the name comes out, people may have disposed of evidence. We don't, we don't know. But I think what will happen is the, the fact that the police have made some arrests. Mark Rowley, who's the most senior um, counter-terrorism officer, is actually doing a lot of work around this. And he's a man who the community have a lot of respect for. So I think uh, what, we, what we see now is a fast-moving investigation, individuals being arrested. And I think we should, we should feel safe. The, the government are taking this very, very seriously. But I think, you know, once again, I, it, the level of depravity has, has gone up a notch here. And this is a callous and absolutely brutal individual. You say we should feel safe, but I'm wondering whether this should have been preventable, this attack. Is it possible for our security services to foil, to thwart every single attempted terror attack in this country? Or do we have to just accept this as a, as a part of modern life now, that there are going to be some who slip through the net? Uh, I, th I think we, we need to work more closely with the community and we need to try and make sure that we're able to identify the individuals who are basically likely, likely to come forward and commit these kind of crimes. Um, but I think, as we've seen, is we had in the last few months we've had two individuals who've caused horrific uh, carnage so I think we have to start looking at whether things like prevent is working effectively and I think that's one of the challenges we've got over the next uh, months and years as we look at the government's prevent strategy which is designed to work with the community more effectively uh, and uh, ISIS have claimed responsibility for this attack, although uh, as far as I know at the moment there is no evidence. They haven't, they never released it, his name in advance of it being released by the authorities uh, and, and the like. Um, what do you think about ISIS having potential terror cells operating within the UK? Is it something that we just have to accept is a reality and we need to get to the bottom of it? Uh, I, 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 mean, I haven't seen any evidence that ISIS have got cells in this country. I think what ISIS do on, ev on every single occasion is that they to say, to say we, we're responsible for this. I mean, if, so I, I'm not entirely sure we can take um, what IC says uh, in, in a very, very positive way or, or, or see it as being correct information. So, but I think what we need to be doing is just making sure that we, the, the community come forward, uh, particularly the Muslim community and the wider community, if they have any concerns about individuals, that they bring those to the notice of the authorities. And the authorities start looking at the prevent strategy uh, and seeing how they can make people feel more confident. Dal Babu, former Chief Superintendent for the Metropolitan Police in London. Always great to get your perspective, Dal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, when we 
when we come back uh, here in Manchester, we will uh, be keeping you up to date with the latest on the, the aftermath of the terror atrocity here. But also there's been other news going on over the last couple of days, and we're going to be looking back at the career of a legend, the actor Roger Moore. Do stay with us for plenty more of the world stories this hour.